When I was in college, I attended a college ministry with a lot of kids who'd grown up in church and then kind of left the churches they grew up in and all muddled around in these different, trying out different college ministries from different churches. And there was a phrase that was popular at that point, especially among my friends, which is that I don't care about denominations, I just want to be a plain, pure Christian. And on one hand, I look back at that statement and statements like it that I've heard, um, and I want to say, absolutely, I completely agree with that. On the one hand, you look at that, and all that's saying is that all Christians are brothers and sisters, no matter what church they're in, though we all have more in common than we have different, that 95% of what we preach is the same thing, and one day, we're going to have to all learn how to get along in heaven together. Um, So I look forward to being in heaven with Catholics and Baptists and Episcopalians and Presbyterians and I look forward to seeing the look of surprise on my Church of Christ friends' faces when they find out we're there too. (laughs) On the one hand, you look at that statement and all it's saying is, I believe that all Christians are one. And that's wonderful, and I will stand by that until the day I die. I do believe all Christians are one. But on the other hand, what that statement does is that statement undercuts the lens through which everybody inevitably approaches Christianity. You see, the truth is, everybody reading scriptures, looking at the Christian faith, comes to different conclusions about the parts that should be emphasized or de-emphasized and what the Christian life looks like. And what that comes up with is we all have kind of different lenses through which we approach the Christian faith. Um, If you go to a church, which is more important, the preaching or the communion? It depends on the lens of the church you grew up in, right? Do you pray in the name of Jesus, or do you pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Depends on the lens of the church you grew up in. Uh, Is foot washing normal, or is foot washing something that freaks you out? depends on the lens of the church you grew up in. And if any of you have ever attended one church for a long time and then gone to another with a different lens, you know the kind of disorientation that brings, right? Because you're all of a sudden sitting in this place and they're saying strange things and doing strange things. You see, the, th- the truth is, all of us have these lenses through which we view the Christian faith. And over history, every time somebody has said, I'm going to get rid of my lens and just be a pure, true, authentic Christian, all they do is create another lens. Case in point is the case of the non-denominationals, who are now a denomination. They said, we're going to get rid of the lenses and just become pure, authentic Christians. And what they they formed was a group of churches that believed the same things, practiced the same things, worship alike, look alike, uh, and all wear the same square glasses with skinny jeans. (laughs) Just not all of them. Not all of them. But it's basically, you're not going to approach Christianity without a lens. You're going to have a lens because we all have our own cultural background and we all are going to look at this great thing that is the Bible and and decide what should be emphasized and what should be de-emphasized. The Wesleyan lens is the one that we inherited as a Methodist church. And that doesn't mean you necessarily know anything about Wesley. It doesn't mean that you necessarily understand Wesley. But what happened was back in the 1700s, two brothers, John and Charles Wesley, were a part of an evangelical revival that swept what was in the colonies and swept England. And this evangelical revival uh, gave birth to many different churches. And one of the movements that came out of the revival was the Methodist movement. And it had a particular lens. It had things that it emphasized and it had things that it de-emphasized. But what happened with that Methodist movement is people were so on fire for Christ, people were so transformed by Christ, that it grew and it didn't stop. It spread, started in England, started in Oxford, spread out from there, spread over to the colonies. Today, it is thriving in Africa, it is thriving in Latin America, it is being reborn in Europe. If you counted, depending on whose numbers you count, because this is a statistics are tricky business, but depending on whose numbers you trust, the children and grandchildren of the Wesleyan movement claim adherence across the globe between 50 or 70 million people. And that started from two brothers 
meeting together in Oxford. What we're going to do over the summer is we, we, we've titled this series Wesley Who because we're going to be talking about Wesleyan Christianity. We're talking about the particular lens through which Wesley approached the faith that then gave rise to that explosive growth that became the, the Methodist, the Wesleyan movement. And this is not necessarily going to be a history course. Some of you are secretly rejoicing at that, and some of you are secretly disappointed. Uh, if you are a nerd and you really want all the history things, I'm going to be sending out some links to articles in the emails. We're going to be doing a little bit of the history in the Sunday school hour, which is immediately before the service. But what we're going to do during the sermon time is I am going to take the sermons of John Wesley that were preached in the 1700s, reinterpret them for the 21st century, and speak those words again today to see what the Holy Spirit does. Because the truth is, when those sermons were originally preached, they converted hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands, upon hearing those words, came to faith in Christ and have their lives radically changed. And so what we're going to do over the summer is we're going to dive into the theology and the thought and the lens of the Wesleyan movement to see what it does in our space today. So that's the summer. What I'm doing this morning is I'm going to give you a brief preview because there are three overarching theological themes that you're going to hear come up over and over again throughout the summer that guided Wesley's thought as he was teaching and preaching what it means to live a faithful Christian life in the Wesleyan tradition. The first overarching theme you're going to hear is this. Faith should be personal. Faith should be personally experienced. Faith should be personally experienced. And here's what that means. In Wesley's time, people went to church because everyone went to church. People believed in God because everyone believed in God. Belief in God was something like a belief in gravity. It was a belief that all rational people held, but no person in their, no person in their right mind would ever say, I have a personal relationship with gravity today. It's not something that happened. And what Wesley, when, it, when Wesley was struggling with the scriptures and struggling with what the Holy Spirit did in the church, he and the people around him came to the conclusion that that's not how Christianity was supposed to be. Christianity wasn't supposed to be a set of, set of intellectual assertions that we just believed in our minds. Christianity was supposed to be something that we experienced for ourselves personally. And so John Wesley's moment happened at a prayer meeting he was already clergy at this time, he was already preaching, he was already teaching, but he had not yet personally experienced God. And one evening, he was at a prayer meeting in Aldersgate, and during the praying and during the preaching, he suddenly felt his heart strangely warmed. And when you read his journal, what he said was this, I suddenly believed that Christ was with me and that my sins, even mine, even mine, my sins were forgiven. You see, what Wesley was pointing out is that there's a difference between knowing something and knowing something, right? There's a difference between knowing something in your head and knowing it in the core of who you are. There is a difference between being able to say, I believe in the forgiveness of sins, and knowing in the very core of your being that you, you, you have been forgiven. You understand? If anyone in this room has ever not known themselves to be a child of God worth the death of the Son of God, this series is for you. If anyone in this room has never not known in the core of their being what it is to be forgiven, and to know yourself as a beloved child of God, this series is for you. Because the foundation of the entire Wesleyan movement was this belief 
that faith in God is not like faith in gravity. That faith in God is something you know in the core of your soul, and that knowing changes everything. So that's the first overarching kind of tenet you're going to hear. Faith should be personally experienced. Second overarching tenet is much less likable. The second overarching tenet is this. Faith should change you. Faith should change you. There was a belief prevalent in Wesley's time, also prevalent in our time, that Christianity is primarily about getting a ticket to heaven and trying not to lose it before you die. Wesley said that that might be the beginnings of salvation, but that is not at all what God is talking about when he talks about authentic Christianity and what God is trying to do when he draws people to himself through faith. When God initiates faith in a person and begins to draw him to himself, God takes people exactly as they are, exactly where they are, exactly who they are. The broken and the hopeless and the lost of the world are all invited through God's prevenient grace to come into relationship with God, and there is no person who is too depraved for the love of God. But then, once God gets a toe in the door, he starts remodeling. Once God gets into your spirit, he starts working things around because his goal is not to leave us as the broken people we started. His goal is to grow us into the holy people he meant, meant us to become. The, the basis of the Wesleyan teaching was that God didn't die to leave us as sinners forever. God didn't die to leave us as slaves to our worst selves. The... the, the the term he used for it, and we're going to get all into this this summer, so just don't worry about understanding it right now. The term he used for it was Christian perfection, and the basic idea was that your faith should influence every part of your life from your finances to your time to your eating and sleep habits to what you wear to what comes out of your mouth to everything else in your life. So when I was thinking about the, the, the Methodist class meetings that were, had started off the whole Methodist movement, I was coming up with an image that would relate to today. I know I've used a lot of athletic metaphors, but just bear with me how, with this one because it really fits. How many of you have ever lost a good friend to CrossFit? So I have, and here's what happened. I had a friend who said, you know what, I want to find a gym. That's a good thing to do with my New Year's resolution. I'm going to get some free time. I'm going to go find a gym. That's fine. Went and found a gym. The next thing I know, they were gone every day of the week. The next thing I know, they were asking her about her sugar intake. The next thing I know, they were asking her how much she slept at night. The next thing I know, they were asking her if she had friends who were encouraging her to drink alcohol. The next thing I know, they were in every little niche and cranny of her life, and at that point I said, sweetheart, you've joined a cult. <laughs> Folks, that's exactly what they said of the early Methodists. They didn't use the word cult, they used the word fanatics. They said those Methodists are not keeping church in the church box. Church is fine. Church is an hour on Sunday morning. You can be a good person, you can go to church, you can check the boxes without doing all the crazy stuff that the Methodists keep doing. And John Wesley said, oh no, you can't. If you want to go to church and check a box, you will keep faith at arm's distance and it will not impact your life in the way that God intended it to impact your life because if you want real faith, it's going to change everything. Which is why when John Wesley preached, he preached, his, he preached about Bible study and prayer and service and worship, and he also preached about what to eat and what to wear and how to exercise and how to spend your time. He preached about how to use your words. He preached about how to use your money. He preached about how to choose your friendships because he believed that the God who died to save us was about the work of saving us, and he wouldn't stop that work of saving us while we were still lost to our own sins. Faith changes you. Faith is personally experienced. Faith changes you. 
The third overarching theological tenet that you're going to hear in this series is this. The faith of an individual Christian should change the world. The faith of an individual Christian should change the world, and here's why. Because even as God is interested in what we eat and what we drink and what we wear, even as God is interested in how we pray and the state of our souls, God is doing all that. God is growing us into holiness because God wants partners in his work of transforming the world. You see, when John Wesley read scripture, he saw this concept called the new creation and the kingdom of God. You heard it a little bit in the scripture that was read to our children. It's a scripture that's often read at Christmas time. The lion shall lie down with the lamb. The wolf and the calf shall play together. The small child shall play over the adder's den. And thy, they will neither hurt nor destroy on my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of God, even as waters cover the sea. And John Wesley pointed to that last scripture and he said, that's my mission statement, to spread scriptural holiness across the earth until the earth is full of the knowledge of God, even as waters cover the sea, which meant that when you looked out in the earth, it was full of hungry who were being fed and naked who were being clothed and lonely who were being comforted and everything that was broken and everything that was dark and everything that was suffering in the world was being made new because of the work of the Holy Spirit through the people of God, working alongside God until the kingdom of God came and the will of God was done on earth as it is in heaven. The faith of a Christian should change the world because Christians who are true in their faith are compelled out of the sanctuary to the schools and the orphanages and the hospitals and the foster care system and the prison system and anywhere else in our world that has broken people that God wants to heal. It's this tenet of Wesleyan teaching that was behind the Wesleyan movement and all that it did in the history of the last 200 years. If you take a look at the social history and what has been done in the last 200 years, it was Wesleyan Christians who were on the forefront of the fight to end slavery, of the fight to end child labor. They were on the forefront of controlling alcoholism when alcoholism was an epidemic that was destroying families. They were on the forefront of the fight for universal education because they believed that every child should read. And as we came across and we built the church into this new country that was starting, not only did they build a church in every county of the United States, they then built a school or a hospital so that the earth would be full of the knowledge of God even as the waters covered the sea, and the kingdom of God might come on earth as it is in heaven. Friends, this summer, we're going to be looking at the power and the passion and the miracle and the transformation that has been the Wesleyan movement over the last 200 years and today. And it has led to hospitals in Africa, and it has led to the end of the slave trade in England, and it has led to schools in the United States. It has led to all of these extraordinary things, and the question that will linger before us across the summer is, what is our place? The path of Wesleyan Christianity that has been blazed before us extends to us an invitation to receive the faith that is personal, that is transformative, and that does nothing less than initiate the kingdom of God in our little corner of creation. And the invitation extended to you over the course of the summer will be, do you want a part of it? Because we here get to take our place in that tradition of people who have been glorifying God 
for 200 years.